I think in, in my mind, the worst case scenario is where Britain cannot work out uh, staying in the single market and then there is uh, somewhat of an abrasive fallout. And so trade comes to a bit of a standstill. But most importantly, because of the confidence issue, uh, investments come to a grinding halt. We've already seen this during the US sequestration, uh, the Eurozone crisis where mm -hmm. there's an austerity squeeze. That's really what led to global uh, trade collapsing. And that's what we've broadly defined as aggregate demand deficiency. So we can't afford another leg down. And that's probably what would hit uh, Asia the worst. So it sounds like uh, you're saying the same uh kind of thing that our last guest was saying in, in, in essence they have to clarify exactly what they want um, what does this mean for Asia you're talking about investments being held up um, from Asia's point of view is there a ripple effect in terms of a slowdown in growth and a slowdown in demand from the UK unfortunately it's quite difficult to sidestep that I mean firstly we've got the first order effect that's to say investments coming from the UK and the eurozone not very large but that first order effect will slow down to begin with and then you've got the recycling effect where China, one of the biggest investors in Asia, along with Japan, may also slow down their investments within Asia. But that's just the investment effect. Uh, Asia is also a big exporter of capital goods. We've got the likes of Korea, Japan, uh, with a lot of smaller Asian countries feeding in. So once demand for capital goods fall because of investments, be it in Eurozone or in Asia or in the UK, that has got a cascading effect on Asian exporters, manufacturers who are already under stress. So as a result of that possibility and, and the possibility of more stress, do you expect more preemptive stimulus from the likes of China, Japan and Korea? Almost certainly. I mean, I mean they're not jumping the gun yet uh, and they're not losing their nerve yet, but they are watching that space very closely, in fact. So the near-term effect may perversely be that Asia rallies, particularly if the G4 economy starts stimulating uh, you know, quite vigorously. Uh, and beyond that, we may have even Asian economies, uh, uh, you know, adding on to the stimulus, be it monetary stimulus, fiscal stimulus, or some kind of uh, support through tax policy, so on and so forth. So that could be the initial impact. But really, the unwinding and, and seeing how trade pans out will take at least two years, as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, Article 50 being triggered. Yeah, well, th that being, um, that being uh, extended to two years, I mean, w which country is best positioned to try to take advantage of the situation and, and try to take advantage of any incoming stimulus? I mean, that, that's, that's really a good question because one of the things about the two years is it gives time to acclimatize. So it, it lowers or it mitigates the possibility of an abrupt shock for the global economy uh, until the details are sorted. Uh, but the economies in a stronger position would be the likes of, uh, say, China, Korea, where they could get some of the substitution trade effects. That's to say, whatever went from, for example, from Germany to the UK and, and vice versa, they could plug into that trade. So mm -hmm. if that was to whittle down between these two, Eurozone and UK, they could capitalize a bit on that. But that's highly contingent on no abrupt effects shrinking the entire pie. So while we're talking about substitution, we also want to keep in mind aggregate demand not shrinking either.